we remember what the Lord did for us. You know, the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. And, and Jesus went through the suffering of the cross and the suffering of crucifixion so that our sins could be forgiven and paid for. That when we stand before God, we don't de- reap the, the consequences of a, a, a life of sin which all of us have lived. Instead, we receive the grace and the mercy and the love of God in return. And Easter reminds us of that amazing love because many of us have grown up in, in a religious culture where we think that, man, I need, to, I need to earn God's love. Anybody ever thought like that? That, man, I'm not good enough for God to love me or how could God possibly forgive me and love me after what I've done, after what I've thought? But the reality is this. God loves us because of what he did for us on the cross and he, dis- he displayed his love on the cross irrespective of what we've done where we've been. His love is that great. You know, one of the things, that, one of the ways the Bible describes God is as a loving father. And I couldn't understand that love until I became a father myself. I have three kids now. I know I look like I'm 19, but I have three kids. Um, my oldest just turned seven. My, my daughter just turned five. And my youngest is now eight weeks old today. And uh, so, yeah, it's kind of, it's, 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 it's like crazy town in my house. We just had a birthday party for my daughter. And seriously, crazy town. I came home and I was like, I got to get out of here. Too many people. Too many little people. Uh, but, you know, I, 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 those of you that are parents, you remember when, you, when your first child was born, you know, you love them immediately and unconditionally. Isn't that true? Even though they've done nothing for you. True. In fact, all they've done for you is cause you pain, right, moms? <laughs> I saw it three times, and like I always say, man, if men had to give birth, there'd be no people on the planet, because there's no way I would do it once, let alone do it again. So, but you women are amazing, and not only that, you bear the child for nine months, go through the labor and delivery, and then you nurse the child for God knows how long, and that's hard, right? And, and, and that's just a picture of the unconditional love that God has. The baby does nothing to earn your love. In fact, the last thing it did was cause you tons of pain, but yet you love it unconditionally. Isn't that true? And that's a picture of God's love for us. It's not that we have to earn his love. It's that he loves us unconditionally. And all he wants in return is that we would respond to his offer of grace displayed to us on the cross, that we would receive his love in return. In fact, God is drawing near to every single one of us. He draws near to us all the time, trying to get our attention. And I want to read this passage the, um, the, the scene that we saw there at the very end showed Mary Magdalene, the first person to see Jesus resurrected. She went to the tomb, expecting to find his body, obviously, in the tomb. She was going to uh, dress it and care for it, but instead she found the stone rolled away. And that scene doesn't show it, but there were two angels that, that she, she spoke with. And I want to read this passage here found in John chapter 20. It's in your notes and it'll be on screen. They, the angels, asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I do not know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, and this is powerful, he said her name, Mary. She turned toward him and cried, Rabboni, which means teacher. At the, at the sound of her name, Jesus uttered her name. Her eyes were open, and she realized that it was him. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. See, often we don't realize that God is drawing near to us. Mary, in a moment of despair, she wasn't expecting to find Jesus resurrected. She goes in her pain and her disappointment. See, everyone thought that Jesus was going to be the Messiah who would, who would militarily defeat the Roman Empire that was oppressing the, Jew, the Jews and that they would establish their kingdom physically on the earth. And when he died, they were disappointed. Anyone ever been disappointed by God? Life tends to do that to us. Isn't that true? But God draws near to us even in the moments of our disappointment. And often we don't recognize him, but he's near. And I dare to say this morning that God is near to us. If you're here today and you've been far from God, maybe you've, you've been a Christian before, straight, or, or maybe you're here for the first time, God has been drawing you. And in fact, he, he wants to call you by name because he loves you. Look at what it says here in Psalm chapter 14. The Lord looks down from heaven and all mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. See, although we don't realize that he's trying to get our attention, and when we dare to open our eyes and say, Jesus, I want to find you. God, I need you. We find that he's actually not far away. He's not out to hide from us. He's not out to trick us. In fact, he wants to reveal his love to us like a loving father. You know, um, like I said, I have three kids. 
And, 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 and like, like, like any good parent, you know, when your kids do bad things, how many of you have ever had kids that do bad things, right? I didn't realize this. this is another thing I learned when I became a parent. Kids actually cause you pain. Any parents ever felt that? Like when they don't listen to you and they stress you out, it actually physically hurts in this region right here in the neck. That's where they get the term pain in the neck. I, anyway, but, but it, it's physical pain. And, and, and I realized this with, with my kids. Like, Man, you guys cause me pain. But what happens when they cause you pain? You don't push them away. Isn't that true? My five-year-old now has been acting out, I think, because we have a new baby. She's no longer the baby. And she's been kind of a pain in the neck, literally. And, uh, and th- th- there's, a, there's a little bit about me that's just like, ah, Maddie, you're killing me right now. But here's what I do. I don't do. I don't go, you know what? Get out of here. I don't want you anymore. Go live with the family across the street because you're just a pain in my neck, right? No, you, you don't do that. CPS would be called on me, and rightly so, right? But instead, what do I do? I realize I need to draw closer to her in relationship to her. So I picked her up from preschool one day early, went to eat Genki Sushi. That's like her favorite thing in the world. And we just talked. And I'm trying to, trying to get, get at her heart, which is, which, which is wounded somehow, probably because of the, the new baby. And, and, I, and I thought about this with God. Sometimes maybe we've all been pains in God's neck at some point. Pains in his hands, pains in his feet. I mean, the, the nails that he endured is because of our sin. But what he doesn't do is draw away from us. What God doesn't do in our sin is say, I don't want you, you're, you're ruined, you're bad, your past is too bad, you can never be forgiven, what you've done is unforgivable. No, God never says that. Instead, he draws closest to us. He draws close to us. And I want to say to you this morning, maybe you've been thinking that, that I've messed up too bad, I'm too far for God to ever love me. He loves all those other good people. By the way, you know, you're, you're not the only one with issues in church. The person sitting next to you, don't look at them. <laughs> Hey, how you doing? We all got issues. I came to church thinking I was the only one with problems. I was the only one that was messed up. And the great thing about church, we get together, we talk, and get together in small group. We call them grace groups. And you find out, wow, you guys are just as messed up as me. This is great. <laughs> this, is, this is amazing. You know? and, and, but that's the reality. We're all just sinners that have come to find grace and love together in the same Savior. And I want to say that to you. God is drawing near to you. He loves you. And like a father, he wants to bridge the gap between you and him. And in fact, he's calling you. He's drawing you right now. In fact, I, wanna, I dare to say he's saying your name right now. Some of you, even in the, in the worship and, and, and throughout this service, you're feeling this touch from God. He's speaking to your heart. He's touching you. I remember I first came to church and God was touching me so powerfully in, in these worship times. The, the music was not as good as it is today. Tony and the worship team is doing a phenomenal job. Back when I first started coming, it was chalangalang. It was bad. It, it was just bad, right, Pastor Paris? You, you were, it wasn't his fault. He came later. But anyway, and, and I remember I just being in church, and we were singing these songs, and it was hokey, but God was touching me. And it was, it was so real and so palpable that I thought, man, are they like putting pheromones in the air or something that's making me feel weird? True story. I'm weird. And so I actually looked behind the stage to see, is there some kind of fog machine creating emotional mist? I don't know. There was nothing there. And then I found out, man, they didn't know what they were doing. They were just singing to Jesus, but the Holy Spirit was touching me. And some of you are here today, and God's touching you. And I want to say that's the Holy Spirit calling you because he loves you, because he wants to have an intimate relationship with you, because he has a purpose and plan for your life. See, we often don't recognize his nearness until we encounter duress or until we go through trials, because then it's, it's then that we stop and we say, God, man, there's got to be more to life than what I'm experiencing. There's got to be more to life than getting up and working my nine to five and dealing with all the stress that I have in life. There's got to be more to life than just living, making money, retiring, and then dying. There's got to be more. And when we experience trauma and trials, it often causes us to reevaluate life. Isn't that true? Look what the Bible says in Psalm 34. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He's not far from the brokenhearted. He's close to us when we go through trials and storms and saves those who are crushed in spirit. He wants to be near to you, so near, like a brother, like a father, like a loving parent. Mary comes to the tomb in her duress and her trial, and what does she find? She finds Jesus looking for her. Now, what's interesting is women in the, in the first century back then, they were treated like second-class citizens. They had really no rights. They couldn't vote. They couldn't do, they, they, they weren't treated very well. And, but yet God chose to reveal himself to a woman. And, you know, th- and that's one of the things they say is a proof that Christianity is real because if you were going to fabricate a lie, you wouldn't have a woman be the first person to encounter the risen Lord. You'd make it some prominent male official. But instead, Jesus reveals himself to her, and many have asked the question, why? And I think the reason why the Bible teaches us is because we are all, we are all Marys. We're all flawed. 
We have, we're all been dis- discredited at some point in our lives. We are all messed up. Mary was a, 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 said to have been a woman of ill repute in her previous life. But yet God revealed himself to her saying that there is no one that is too far. There is no one that is too broken that God would not reveal his love to. And I think it's an amazing thing. Jesus invites us into intimate personal relationship with himself. That's what he's after. Relationship, right? Parents, that's all you want from your kids. You want relationship. You want to walk through life with them. You want to know them. The the thing that would break your heart the most is if one of your children ever said, Mom, Dad, I don't want anything to do with you. I don't want a relationship with you. Don't talk to me. Don't see me. I don't want anything to do with you. And our Father God feels the same way. He loves us like a parent, like a father. And all he wants is a relationship with us, to walk with us through life, to do relationship with us. But sadly, instead, many of us treat God just like religion. We clock in, we clock out, we punch in, and we punch out with God. I did my duty, God, and I'm done. See, that's one of the downfalls of a, of a great day like Easter is we come and we celebrate and, we're so, and, we, and we need to, but we can think that that's it. I did my religious duty for the year or half the year. I'll come back during Christmas, and God will be pleased with me. Listen, if, one, if my kids acted that way, I would be hurt. I would be a little upset, but more than that, I'd be hurt that you don't want a relationship with me after all I've done for you, and all my heart desires is to be with you. Right, parents? That's all you want is to be with your kids. And that's all that our Father God wants from us, a relationship with us because he loves us like a parent loves his child. He invites us into intimate, personal relationship with himself like a father and his child. Look at what this passage says in Isaiah. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, he who formed you, there's this intimacy there. Not just a distant God far away on some galaxy, but he's near to us. And this is what he says, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. He knows your name. He knows every hair on your head. He numbers them, in fact, the Bible tells us. And he calls us by name. And look at what he says, I love this, you are mine. Like a father, you're mine. I love telling my kids, I love you because you're mine. I tuck them in every night and I kiss them and I, we, we, we pray together. And I just want to remind them that I love them simply because they're mine. Even if the last thing they did was punch their sister. You know what I'm saying? You're still mine. Don't do that, by the way. But I love you. You're mine. And we'll talk about this in the morning because I'm tired. All right? But I've summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. See the heart of our Father? When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God. And then Isaiah continues in, verse, in chapter 49. I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. You know those nail-scarred hands? That's for you. That's for me. It's for sinners just like us. You know, they say in heaven, the only scars that will remain, because we're going to get resurrected bodies in heaven, the whole deal. The only scars that will remain are going to be the scars on Jesus' body, his hands, his feet, his head, and his side. And it'll be an eternal reminder to us what it costs for us to get there. The scars on his hands, the scars on his feet are there for us. He's engraved us on the palms of of his hand because he loves us. We are his creation. We are his masterpiece made in his image, and he loves us. You know, he calls us by name. Many of you have felt his call, and maybe at different times we've responded, and then we've drawn away, but he's calling you again. Maybe today the Holy Spirit is calling you, and he's drawing you, and he not only does he want to save us from our sin and for eternal life, but there's a destiny that he has for us on this earth. You realize that, that you're not here by accident. We're not here by accident. Every one of us has a unique assignment. Some are are destined to dance, and that is certainly not me. I made that very clear. Uh, I've tried. It's not. But we all have we all all have an assignment. We all have a lane. And somebody laughed way too hard back there when I said that. By the way, I just caught that. It hurts. Anyway, um, but we all have an assignment on this earth. And what God and God doesn't just want to save us and then go off do your own thing, punch my ticket to heaven and then leave him alone. No, God says I want to walk with you. And I want to lead you into the destiny and the purpose that he's put us here on the earth for. It doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are. You're not done yet. It, t- turn to your neighbor tell him, you're not done yet. Some of you may be thinking, man, I'm, I'm, I'm old. I'm past my time. I did that thing. No, no, no. God's not done writing the story of your life. He's not done with your destiny. You may have grandkids to raise and to impart the story of the gospel into and to train them up to be young men and young women who are going to follow after God. If you're young, it's never too early to begin walking with God and fulfilling your destiny. See, God wants to be a part of all of that. I get excited as a parent as I see my kids develop new skills and talents and desires. I want to develop that so that they can fulfill the plan and purpose of God. God wants to walk with you. And that's why we can't just, you know, say some prayer magically and then walk away from him. He wants to walk with us every single day through every moment of our lives, guiding us 
to the purpose and plan that he has for us. And this morning we have with us um, a special guest who's going to share her testimony that I think powerfully illustrates all of this. Her name is Representative Sharon Har. She is the, uh, the, the state representative over the 42nd District, which covers Kapolei and Makakilo. Anyone from Kapolei and Makakilo? Oh, you're supposed to chihu. That's what Kapolei and Makakilo does, right? I'm, uh, I'm from Waipahu. You know, we do that. Okay. Anyway, right? So she, she oversees uh, Kapolei and Makakilo, and her testimony is very powerful, and, and, it, and it illustrates this is what God walking through us through life. So will you do me a favor, Grace Bible Pro side? The Bible says to honor your leaders. Can you stand to your feet? And can we give a greeting to Representative Sharon Har? And I'm just going to turn her loose because she's such a great speaker. You may be seated yes, and be encouraged by her testimony. Good morning, Grace Bible Pro side. Thank you so much for having me. Um, you know, as Pastor Billy was just saying, nothing happens just because it happens. It's because God has a plan. I've actually been wanting to come to this church for some time. I've never been to this church. Um, my husband's cousin goes to this church. I have many friends who go to this church. And I saw Pastor Norman two weeks ago, and I told him I had been struggling with some things in my life. And then he en ends up inviting me to speak and do a testimony before this church. So... Once again, God is great. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sharon Har. I am the state representative of District 42, Kapolei Makakilo, Kapolei, the second city. I've been in office for 10 years now, and um, I have another job. I'm also a lawyer, and people say, oh, gosh, she's a lawyer and a politician. Why doesn't she just sell used cars while she's at it? And I tell people that's just my job. It's what I do for a living, but first and foremost, before being an attorney, before being a politician, I am a Christian. And I am so blessed. I am the oldest daughter of Korean immigrants' parents. I am a second-generation Korean-American. I know I don't look Korean, but I'm 100% Korean. And uh, both my parents came from Korea. They immigrated to America and obviously seeking a better life for my brother and myself. My father had his PhD in business economics, and my mother has her master's in microbiology. So I was fortunate to get some brains from my parents. Um, as long as I can remember, I have known God, and it was because of my parents. I was raised in the church. I went to Bible study. I went to church every Sunday. And my father was an elder in the church. My mother was um, a member of the church choir. And so I should have had the correct foundation to lead a model Christian life. And you would think that that would have been my path. But then I went off to college. I went off to college far away on the East Coast. And for the first time in my life, I discovered, discovered something called freedom. I was away from my parents, and I realized I can do whatever I want. And they're not around. And so I would talk on the phone with my parents and tell them, oh, everything's fine. But in the meantime, I wasn't going to class. And I started down a life of sin. I was partying all the time, drinking, smoking, and not taking school seriously. Well, this life of sin ended up in me being put on academic probation. I got a letter from the school essentially telling me that I had one semester, I had one last chance to get my grades up or I would be kicked out of school. I remember going home that winter. It was my junior year and I was in absolute fear for my life. I said, my parents are going to kill me. I'm dead. It's over for me. And so when I sat down with my parents, I had the letter, and I looked at the two of them, and I said, I have something I've got to tell you. And they looked at each other and didn't say anything. And I thought, oh, gosh, it's really bad now because they're not yelling at me. Instead, my father said, let's go. Let's go for a walk. And I didn't know what was going on because he hadn't started yelling at me yet. And yet, my father said, let's go. We went outside, and he held my hand. And he asked me, how did you get here? What, what led to this point? And of course, I was in denial. I didn't want to admit I was sinning. I kept telling my dad, no, dad, I just, I'm not smart enough. I don't belong at this school. It's not meant to be. I just, I just can't handle it. It's just not my thing. And my dad asked me, point blank, are you trying? And I said, yes, Dad, I'm trying. Of course, I didn't want to talk about the partying. I just said, yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying. It's just not meant to be. And my father said to me, well, how about this? Why don't we make a deal with each other? You commit one semester to me. 
you tell me that you're going to go back to school for one semester and you're going to try. You're going to go to all your classes and you are going to study every single day. And then he said to me, I said, well, what do I get in return? And my father said, I'm going to buy you a brand new computer. So at the time, the Macintosh was the, the hottest computer at the time. It was black and white. It was a tiny little screen. I thought it was so cool when I got it. And so my father bought me a Macintosh computer. He bought me a printer. And we hugged as I went back to school. And he said, don't forget your promise. And I said, OK, Dad. So every night for one semester, I forsake partying. I didn't go to any parties. On Friday nights, I was in the library. I studied and studied because I had made a promise to my father. That semester, I came home with a 3.95. And so I knew at that time it was God reaching out to me through my father, telling me he wanted to have a relationship with me. I ended up working in New York City, and I was making a lot of money for someone who was in their early 20s. I was working on Wall Street. I worked for one of the largest law firms, and I was making a lot of money. And while I always knew God was there, I still refused to surrender my life to him. And so, once again, I started down a path of sin, being the human being that I am. I got into law school, and once again, I started partying. I didn't go to class, and I continued to lead a life of sin. Once again, this life of sin culminated in me not passing the bar exam. I was absolutely mortified that I didn't pass the bar exam. And so... I knew that, once again, God was trying to call me to come back to him. My mother, this time, was the one who got involved. She came to Hawaii, and she said to me, how did we get here? And of course, it wasn't partying. I just said, Mom, it's not meant to be. I'm not supposed to be a lawyer. God doesn't want me to be a lawyer. It's, I can't pass the bar exam. It's not meant to be. So I came up with every excuse. And my mother said to me, well, why don't we go to Korea for two and a half months, and you study every single day? And I was like, really? And so my mom said, Let's, that's the plan. Why don't we go to Korea? So I went to Korea for two and a half months, and all I did was study every single day for the bar exam. Morning, from the, my mom would drop me off first thing in the morning at 7 a.m. at the library. I studied until 6 p.m. every night. So I came back in February. I passed the bar exam. So fast forward to 2006, and you know, people always say, what is my plan in life? And I always tell people, never say never. In a prior life, I had been in government. I had worked for then Lieutenant Governor Maisie Hirono. And people kept saying to me, you should run for office. You'd be really good. And I would look at people and say, are you crazy? And I would say, I would never run for office. Well, you know, like they say, never say never, because in 2006, uh, because I was living in Kapolei at the time, and I still live in Kapolei, because of my background, uh, I specialize in construction and real estate and land use development. And God was speaking to me that he had a plan for me. And people were very upset in Kapolei because of all the development that was happening. And I felt that because of my background as an attorney, I would be able to speak to those issues while campaigning. So I decided, OK, let's go for it, Lord. If this is what you're calling me to do, I'll do it. Two days after I went to the Office of Elections and signed my papers to run for office, my mother called me. And she said, we have to have a family meeting. And I said, why? What's going on? And my mother told me that my father had stage 4 pancreatic cancer. Every doctor we had been to had told my father, told my family, that my dad was going to die in three to six months. His cancer was so far advanced, there was nothing they could do for my father. So I sat down with my dad, and I told my dad, you know what? I'm not going to run for office, Dad. I want to be with you. And my father looked at me and said, no, you're going to run for office because God wants you to run for office, and I'm going to help you. Now, let me get something straight. Normal people don't run for office. Office is not a normal thing because if you think about it in an election, what is it? It's a popularity contest, right? It's basically one person saying, pick me over this guy. And I kept thinking to myself during that first election, what have I gotten myself into, Lord? I can't do this. There's no way I'm going to win. I wasn't on neighborhood board. I had no name recognition. I had no money. And I wasn't a mom, I had, so I didn't have the soccer mom connection. I just came out of nowhere. And I remember the first time I ran for office, people looked at me and they laughed. They patted me in the head. They go, oh, cute little girl. You're running for office. And there were days I would wake up and start crying hysterically and saying to God, what have I gotten myself into? Once again, I screwed it up. 
I can't do this, Lord. I'm, there's no way I'm going to win. And I, I sat there feeling sorry for myself. God would say to me, get out of bed and stop crying. Because think about your father who's downstairs right now dealing with his mortality. God would tell me, I gave you a personality. Go use it. So I went knocking door to door every single day. And I will never forget that first house I knocked on the door. The gentleman opened the door and basically told me, get the hell off my property. He looked at me. He's like, this is a Republican country. You're a Democrat. You will never, ever win in this district. And I just said, thank you. And I ran to my car, and I started crying again. And I was like, oh, God, I can't do this. I can't do this. I'm freaking out. And once again, God spoke to me and told me, you have no money. You have no name recognition. You have no children. I gave you a personality. Go out there and start knocking on doors. So I went to the second house. And as soon as the door opened, the woman, I, I couldn't even say hello. She just grabbed me and hugged me. And she said, thank you for running for office. We've been waiting for someone like you. And I knew once again it was God revealing himself to me that he was going to get me through this. The night of the election, my supporters had all asked me, are you nervous? Are you scared? And it was the first time in my life that I could honestly say I was at complete peace because I had given my life to God. I realized that it wasn't about the end result that night. It was about the journey. God had put so many wonderful people into my life from walking door to door. And my relationship with my father had grown to a level I never knew it could be. So on the night of the election, the printout came, and I won by 369 votes. My father hugged me tightly, and he said to me, I'm going to live forever. My father lived for two years after that first election. He sat with me and saw me get sworn in, and uh, he sat with me on this, uh, house of the, uh, the floor of the House of Representatives. Every doctor said he was a miracle, and I say that was all God. Being in politics is not easy. As politicians, as law, we are lawmakers. We make laws for the people of the state of Hawaii. And so, really, we are supposed to be looking out for all of you. We are supposed to be making sound policy that will make the lives of the people of the state of Hawaii better. And as I got into this arena of politics, I realized it wasn't about policy. It was about power. I've always said that if you do not have a strong moral compass in politics, you are going to get messed up very quickly. Because people always want something from you, and people are always bribing you with something. You have to be very strong. I got to know many of you through the special session for SB1, same-sex marriage. And I want this to be very clear. I never intended to be the poster child for anti-same-sex marriage. I thought I was just going to quietly go in, vote no, and that would be it. But as each day went on during that special session, I was so outraged at what I saw. We had our Christian brothers and sisters coming to testify, many of them. If, you, if any of you came to see, you remember the process. You had to take a number. There were thousands of people, and when they called your number, if you missed it, you, you lost your chance. And I was so upset that the people were not being listened to. So before I knew it, while it wasn't my plan for myself, it was God's plan for me to be a voice for our Christian brothers and sisters. There were days that I would wake up during the special session, and I would cry to the Lord saying, God, I don't know. I don't think we can stop this. I don't know what I'm doing, Lord. I don't know if we can stop this thing called same-sex marriage. I don't know what I'm doing. And the Lord would continue to say to me, Sharon, trust in me. I have you there for a reason. And while I didn't understand it at the time, I understand it now. As hard as the special session was and going through that experience, I never knew many of the pastors on this island including Pastor Norman. And it was through that special session I got to know many of the pastors on this island. And since then, I've spoken at many churches giving my testimony. And so at the time, while I didn't understand it, it all came very clear to me that once I trusted in God, his path became clear for me. 
I was vilified during the, same spe uh, the special session for same-sex marriage. Um, I got death threats. I actually got quite a few death threats. Um, I was called every name under the sun. Every curse name, I was called. I was called a bigot. I was called a homophobe. Um, there's Honolulu Magazine, which is a pretty, uh, it's a pretty mainstream magazine. They had a whole section about winners and losers, and they called me a loser. I remember the night when same-sex marriage had passed, and the proponents were yelling in my face saying, where's your God now? I remember seeing a rainbow flag thrown over the statue of Queen Liliuokalani, and people laughing at me saying, where's your God now? And I was at complete peace that night because I knew he was in control, because I had trusted in him for the first time in my life. God gave me several verses during that same-sex marriage special session. In Peter 4.16, God told me, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear his name. In Psalm 56.4, God told me, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust and am not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? So for today's testimony, what I, want you to, what, to, what I want to get across to all of you is this. It's about trusting God, putting your faith in him. Like Pastor Billy says, he wants to have a relationship with you. God was always there in my life, but I didn't surrender to him. I didn't want to give my life up to him. I thought I was in control. And it wasn't until I completely gave my life to God and trusted in him that he started to reveal himself to me and show me what his purpose was for me in my life. When I first ran for office, I was single. And people used to say to me, what's wrong with you? Why are you not married? And I used to just say, you know what? I just haven't met the right guy yet. After uh, I uh, got into office, two years after I got into office, God brought me my soulmate, my husband, who I'd like to recognize, uh, my husband, Dr. Vince Todd, who is truly a blessing in my life and who is a rock for me. And I also want to recognize my mother, the, my mother, um, Catherine Har. she's here too. But what I'd like to leave you with is this today, Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 6. Proverbs 3 says, verses 5 through 6 say this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. As you think about your paths today, about God's will for your life, remember that knowing the will of God is not so much a life map or trying to figure out some convoluted formula. It's about having a relationship with him. And it wasn't until I trusted him and gave my life to him that I could fully have that relationship and I could begin to see what his purpose was for me. So the will of God is not accomplished in your life but it's uh, by figuring out this roadmap, but it's found as you walk with God one day at a time, one step at a time, trusting him in all that you do. It is when you do that that he will be made apparent in your life. And so on this Easter Sunday, this glorious day, this wonderful holiday in which our Savior, Jesus Christ, has risen, my hope and prayer for all of you is that you will trust in the Lord with all your heart and know that he wants a relationship with you. And once you trust in him, he will make your path clear as he's done for me. Thank you very much for this opportunity. God bless you all. Thank you so much for sharing your testimony. Um, you know, all politics aside, you know, you've taken a lot of abuse for standing up for your, your convictions and obeying God in, in, in government. You could be making a lot of money out in the marketplace as an attorney as you were before. I mean, I know they don't pay representatives as well as you could be making. Death threats and all, why do you keep doing what you're doing? You know, taking that abuse, being crucified publicly uh, for your faith, why do you keep on doing that? Thank you for that question, Pastor Billy. Why do I keep doing it? It's because that's God's purpose for me. You know, every morning I wake up and I pray and I thank God for my life. I just can't believe how amazing the Lord is and how much 
he loves me and how blessed I am. And I always say to God, I don't deserve this life you've given me. And that is why I try to honor him in everything that I do. And so I do this job because I love God. Very much in the same way my parents have loved me unconditionally, God loves me unconditionally. And I want to honor him. He has put me in this position for a reason. And as hard as it's been, it hasn't been easy. I do it because, number one, he never gives me more than I can handle. But number two, because he put me here because I trusted in him. That's great. Well, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for standing thank you, for Pastor the Lord. Peter. And thank you for sharing your story. God bless you. You know, one of the things I loved about Representative Har's testimony, we were, we were talking on the phone on Friday, is just the role that her father played in her life. When she was wayward in college and she thought that, you know, she was living her own way apart from God. When she came home, her father didn't chastise her or kill her, <laughs> right? He, he took her for a walk and he, he held her hand and he bought her a Macintosh, so it must be a God. Um, you know, anyway. Um, but I want you to think about that. That's, that's the heart of our Father God. All of us have gone wayward at some point. Maybe that's, that's your story right now. But like Sharon Har is a dad, God draws close to you. And he wants to have a relationship. He wants to take you for a walk. He wants to equip you for everything that you need to be successful in the purpose and plan that God put you here on earth for. And he wants to walk with you through every moment of your life, through the successes, through the trials, through the death threats, through, through everything. God wants to be there because he made you for a reason. And like a father, he wants to, to be alongside with you every step of the way. And all it takes is for us to open up our heart to him. I want to, you know, look at this, this last point here in your notes. With nail-scarred hands, he knocks on the door of our God-shaped hearts. And he's waiting for us to simply open the door, to say yes to him. And maybe we've been walking away from him, doing our own thing. Maybe we, we're off and on, hot and cold with him. All he's waiting for is for us to open the door and, and invite him into our lives to respond to the gift of the, of the gospel of grace, to respond to what he's done for us on the cross and to walk with him. Revelation 3.20 says, Here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. He wants fellowship, relationship. John 1.12 says, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gives the right to become children of God. That's his heart for you. That's his heart for me. Will you respond to him as he's calling you this morning to a brand new beginning, to a brand new life, to, to a destiny that is not just on your own, but is God walking alongside with you. No matter how young, it's not too early. No matter how old you are, it's not too late. The story of God wants to be written through your life if we'll say yes to him.